The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio, brought to you by IANS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. So last Thursday, we celebrated Thanksgiving, and today, turns out, my birthday falls on a Monday, and uh, I certainly have much to be thankful for in my life. I truly believe that uh, giving thanks ranks right up there with forgiveness and compassion Spiritual elements with real-life opportunities to help heal our relationships with each other and to help heal the world. But, you know, when I'm sitting at the table with a turkey and all the side dishes and smiling family all around, the old doubts return. Is it right to be thankful for our comforts and our blessings when so much of the world is in turmoil and distress? Well, a favorite poem of mine by Dr. Doggerel actually sums up these doubts pretty well, at least from the turkey's point of view. It's entitled, uh, On Thanksgiving, Who Do Turkeys Thank? And I thought I'd share it with you. When asked about the next Thanksgiving, the turkey said, hey, it's a living. But that, of course, was in July when grass was green, the sun shone high, and time seemed much more malleable and the act seemed much more fallible. But now, of course, it's in November. The chills no thrill when you remember that that's the time the axe must fall on turkey necks, both large and small. Fat birds whose thoughts seek to remind them their carefree days are all behind them. Our lives pass quickly, that's for sure. We look at death and see no cure. So we, like they, must turn away and do our living day by day, though out there is death certitude. To talk about it would be rude. What happens to that turkey soul? <clears throat> when head leaves body, what control do thoughtless turkeys then forsake? The flash of axe, the quick dull ache, and then perhaps a liberation? The soul freed up for, for some vacation, perhaps of an ethereal sort? Goodbye, old body. Time to report. Do turkey angels from on high, a turkey god high in the sky, uh, sky only dreamed by turkey birds, sky denied to flightless turkey herds. Would God the fate of turkeys hobble just because their language gobble, gobble is less refined or more prosaic than ours indeed? And who can weigh it after all the Intrinsic worth of birds might well be measured without words. If God notes every sparrow's fall, the fall of turkeys must appall the sanctity of heaven's gate. The thanks we give, the turkeys pate. We all might wish a better fate as we dish from that heaping plate, part of our turkey now reduced to bits and pieces, souls set loose that we ourselves must also be, a meal for worms, a soul set free. A different species then will be. A different barnyard then we'll see. All breathing, all breathing beings from the same tree. All life the same as you and me. So, on Thanksgiving, who do turkeys thank? Needless to say, there are categories of thankfulness that make me feel really uncomfortable even to this day. Take, for instance, my mother's warning to me when I was a child to be grateful for that plate of food in front of me, even if it was something I hated the taste of, like liver and spinach, because there were starving children, after all, in China who would have been ever so thankful for a meal like that. Uh, clearly, I was meant to be thankful for situations in which I had plenty and others did not. But then encountering some of the parables, parables we were taught in Sunday school, having good things in this life and not sharing could be a real problem. Take the one Jesus taught about the rich man and Lazarus, which goes, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, 
and lived in luxury every day. And at his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, longing to eat what, sh what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to, heaven, to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am ag in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. That's um, The story is told in Luke uh, chapter 16, 19 through 26. So in other words, if you are so well off in this life as to be thankful for your blessings, then you may be in an eternal situation, morally speaking, that no one upon reflection would be thankful for. And even sharing some of your blessings, at least for some people, might not be enough. Take Jesus' parable about the rich young man who asked what he should be doing in this life in order to be embraced by God in the next. This is from Mark 10, uh, 17 through 23. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran, ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go, sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and then come, follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Was this an additional requirement laid on this particular man because Jesus loved him? Or should we all take Jesus' words to heart? And if we have the faith to give away all we possess and embrace a life of poverty like St. Francis did, would even that be enough if we didn't take on the work of service as well? Certainly there are some poor who just justify a life of crime because of their circumstances. Should a poor man be thankful to God for successfully pickpocketing a wallet full of $100 bills? Would it be any better if he shared his loot with others in need? Various religions have muddied the water even further when it comes to being thankful. Some fundamental Christians believe all you need is faith in the saving power of Jesus to make it to heaven. In other words, for them, what you do to others is remarkably irrelevant to your ultimate salvation. The Catholic Church, as an example, in the Middle Ages taught that giving whatever you could to the priests, monks, and nuns would guarantee God's love. Quite a self-serving concept, to be sure. In fact, uh, one could even pay what they called indulgences to the priests to say a mass for your deceased father or son or mother in order to assure their soul's speedy release from purgatory, a place that was considered a place of temporary punishment, into the waiting arms of God's love, something to be thankful for, for sure. And then you come to Protestantism and the teachings of a, a theologian like John Calvin, who believed that because God already knew who was chosen to be saved, that he would start rewarding them in this life. Uh, called predestination, it went something like this. Because God already knows everything that will happen, he has already decided who will be saved and who will not. 
Therefore, there is nothing we can do in our lives to change our eternal destiny. It's all been seen before in God's eyes. <clears throat> Reflecting on Calvin's teaching, the Orthodox Presbyterian book Westminster Confession of Faith, which was uh, written in 1643, states, God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass. Yet so as thereby neither is God the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of the creatures, nor is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established, by the decree of God for the manifestation of his glory, some men and angels are predestined unto everlasting life, and others for foreordained to everlasting death. As God hath appointed the elect unto glory, so hath he by the eternal and most free purpose of his will foreordained all the means thereto. Wherefore, those who are elected are effectually called unto faith in Christ by his Spirit, working in due season. They are justified, adopted, sanctified, and kept by his power through faith unto salvation. Neither are any other redeemed by Christ, effectually called, justified, adopted, sanctified, and saved, but only the elect. The rest of mankind, God was pleased according to the unsearchable counsel of his own will, whereby he extendeth or withholdeth mercy as he pleaseth for the glory of his sovereign power over his creatures to pass by and to ordain them to dishonor and wrath for their sin to the praise of his glorious justice. That's from uh, chapter 3 of um, uh, this document that was drafted by... Um, uh, the Calvinist Westminster Confession of Faith, 1643. So under this way of looking at things, Calvinists often believe that the uh, rich and successful Christian members of society are rich and successful because God has already rewarded them in this life as an, in anticipation of the blessings to come. <laughs> under this teaching, uh, whether the rich man gave all he was possessed to the poor or not, God had already made his decision about the, that man's salvation. So if your church tells you you are among the elect, and many churches do tell you just that, then you have everything to be thankful for to God. Other than that, dot, dot, dot. And then for Hindus, there's the notion of karma. It's um, utilized in other um faiths that believe in reincarnation as well, but it's understood understood most famously in the Hindu, Hindu tradition. This idea teaches that your status in this lifetime depends on your good works and bad in the last. In other words, if you were rich and successful in this life, you must have done great things in your previous existences. On that account, then, if, if you've been blessed in this life, it's because you earned it. Likewise, if you are part of the untouchable class in this life, low man on the totem pole, as it were, you must have earned that too. And so nobody has to do anything for you because you created your situation on your own. Who do you thank in a situation like that? And this is a, this is a question for the reincarnationists. Do you thank yourself for having done wonderful things you can no longer even remember? Do you thank the gods for guiding you in the past so as to make you happy in this one? The dilemma some of these approaches to thankfulness engender leave me with this question. Is the very act of thankfulness a self-serving congratulations that God is basically on your side? I mean, religious denominations have a history of thinking this way and and on a larger scale, whole countries have indulged themselves in the same delusion. Well, compare the self-congratulatory song, I'm proud to be an American, where at least I know I'm free, with Jesus' parable. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray one a Pharisee, and the other a tax collector. 
The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus said, according to Luke, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, the Pharisee, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And that comes from Luke chapter 18, 9 through 14. So, going through all these thoughts, um, and contemplating the degree to which God wants us to praise him for our blessings, I ran across uh, our President Donald Trump's recent attack on LeVar Ball for not being grateful enough to Trump for LeVar's son not going to a Chinese prison for these shoplifting charges that were leveled on three UCLA basketball players in China. You've probably heard uh, this in the news. Three uh, UCLA basketball players were picked up in China for shoplifting pairs of uh, expensive uh, sunglasses, dark glasses. And um, Trump, although we're not sure how much he participated in all of this, felt slighted by Ball's father for not being thankful enough um, for um, Trump's claim that he was the one responsible for getting these guys out of uh, the Chinese jail they were destined to go to. Um, Trump was reported by CNN as saying, I should have left the UCLA players in jail. And CNN went on to report the president's following tweets. So I'll just quote you this, these two tweets together here. It wasn't the White House. It wasn't the State Department. It wasn't Father Lavar's so-called people on the ground in China that got his son out of the long-term prison sentence. And then in caps, it was me. Too bad. LeVar is just a poor man's version of Don King, but without the hair. Just think, LeVar, you could have spent the next 10 to 15 years during Thanksgiving with your son in China, but no NBA contract to support you. But remember, LeVar, shoplifting is not a little thing. It's a really big deal, especially in China. Ungrateful fool. The Greek word for love is agape. It's love given without expectation. And in this past Sunday's gospel reading, uh, I heard once again Jesus' words about the final judgment when he's talking about separating the sheep from the goats. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, and he will sit on the throne, on the throne of his glory. There are actually, as um, I spoke about this uh, several weeks ago, um, if you look back on judgments, there are <clears throat> basically two judgments described in um, the Bible. Uh, one is um, the Bema judgment, which is what I interpret to be uh, the life review that Jesus puts us through after each lifetime. It's a very loving, it's very generous, it's a very forgiving judgment. And then there's what they call the white throne judgment. It's described here, the sheep and the goats. It's also described um, in um, uh, Revelation. And I think I use the Revelation quotes for my little thing on judgment. But this is like the final one, and it's based on what we do in our lives. So, let me read this. This is from Matthew 25, 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. And then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, 
you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are my mem- who are members of my family, you did it to me. And when he says members of my family, I take that to mean all of humanity. Then um, he goes on, um, and I, th- I think the only reason he goes on to repeat this is... Um, uh, I'm turning the page here. To um, the the reason he goes on is just just to emphasize what um, what he had to uh, say once again. But let me let me read that to you. Okay, then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. And they also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? And he will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So it's the same story told uh, first from the sheep's point of view, then from the goat's point of view. The sheep are uh, the wheat, the goats are the tares. And in some ways, it lends credence to uh, the Calvinist theory that God knows from the beginning. But God also gives us free will. And uh, don't believe that um, he is blessing those in advance of their deaths for being uh, the good guys. God is not some crazy tyrant, ready to be offended by any perceived slight to his power. Instead, he wants us to serve him by serving the least of our fellow men and women and children. When we feed the hungry, clothe and shelter those in need, then we are thanking God the way he wants to be thanked for all he has done for us. In looking at religious practices around the world, I think perhaps the most direct, the simplest expression of how God wants our thanks may be captured in the Hawaiian practice of ho'oponopono. Ho'oponopono. It's a Hawaiian practice of reconciliation and forgiveness. Uh, Similar forgiveness practices are performed on islands throughout the South Pacific, including Hawaii, Samoa, Tahiti, and New Zealand. The words can be sung, they can be prayed and meditated upon, but they require the power of action behind the words. But here's how it goes. It's so simple. It's so basic to the, to the whole notion of um, our relationship with God and one another. I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. Amen. So, <clears throat> Ho'oponopono is a mantra, it's part of this ancient Hawaiian meditation that embodies the essential content of prayer of of all our religions, basically, if you get right down to the nitty-gritty. And this is where 
thanksgiving belongs. Right after expressions of love and a plea for forgiveness, love, apology, a request for forgiveness and thanks are inextricably linked. Well, by now, dear listeners, you may be wondering what all this has to do with near-death experience. And yet, if you've been listening to the NDE accounts we report week after week on the show, you know that those experiences, for the most part, confirm that God is the source and essence of love and wants us to identify with him by making ourselves clear channels for that love to come through. You know, if you think about it, in this country alone, there are more than 770 near-death experiences happening every day. In this country alone, more than 770 That should mean there are more than 770 teachers graduating from God's own near instantaneous NDE seminary where those blessed NDEers experience, uh, where they experience the nature of love firsthand and what real thankfulness is all about. By rights, every NDEer should dedicate their thanksgiving to telling people where they went what they saw, what they learned during their NDE. And when you think about it, why only Thanksgiving? And why only in the United States? If a thousand NDEers a day, a day, would come back and report throughout the world on what they learned during their NDE, it would be like 365,000 disciples a year being sent directly by God to do God's work on earth and the potential for turning this world around for making it what God intended for it in the first place, would be, I believe, irresistible. Well, we have a little time left, so I thought maybe I would read one more short poem by Dr. Doggerel addressing this last little topic of conversation. It's called Now That You Know. Now that you know our souls are eternal, now that you've died into the light, now that you've seen there's nothing infernal waiting ahead for those who do right, how do you bring that message to others? How do you prove there's nothing to fear? Draw them in close, your sisters and brothers, and show them that love is always that near. If I had the voice to sing out this message, if I had the poems to make the words clear, if I had the lifetime I've wasted before this, my heart would disclose just what you long to hear. When our souls travel up from this valley of tears and see the great power that surrounds us with love, your faith will, like waves, wash away all the darkness And the light that is love pours down from above. Well, a belated wish for a happy Thanksgiving. And now we go into the Christmas season, which is supposed to be not so much a time of commercialism, but a time of expectation and joy and renewal. It combines the hopes and fears of many religions besides the Christian one in this season of um, the light coming back as the days begin to lengthen. We identify with that light, and we need to be channels of that light. And so I invite you all to uh, share what you know from your own personal uh, NDEs, from your own personal mystical experiences, and I invite you to share it on this program. I hope you will come on. Um, if you've been thinking you'd like to talk about your own NDE or, or personal mystical experience on this show, please send me an email with a brief discussion of what you've experienced and your phone number. And if you'd like to listen to this show again or any of our past shows, just go to our website at nderadio.org. For information on IANS, check out their website at iands.org. And join us again next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern, for more NDE Radio. This is Lee Whitting saying thanks for listening.